Welcome back after this short break. Observing social media, I see that word and hashtag Russia is trending on all social media due to our conference, I suppose. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Fershbo, it's a great pri privilege for me to introduce to you our special guest, NATO Deputy Secretary General, Ambassador Alexander Fershbo. Ambassador Fershbo has a long and distinguished record of service to his country and to the Western Alliance. He was a career member of the United States Foreign Service from 1977 to 2008. You started to, your work before I was born. It's... Serving as US ambassador to NATO between 1998 and 2001, US ambassador to Russia between 2001 and 2005, and US ambassador to the Republic of Korea, South Korea, between 2005 and 2008. After three years as Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, he joined NATO as Deputy Secretary General in 2012. In my welcome remarks at the beginning of the conference yesterday morning, I mentioned that as well as traditional collective security issues, it is important that the Western Alliance retains its sense of moral clarity. As US ambassador in the, uh, South Korea, Ambassador Fershbo demonstrated moral clarity and leadership in consistently drawing attention to the crimes of North Korean regime. He is deserving of our admiration for his principled approach for his career to wide range of some of the most difficult issues in global politics, and few people are better placed to enlighten us on the subject of European and transatlantic security today. Ambassador, we are so delighted we are able to, that you were able to join us at the Warsaw Security Forum. Welcome. I will yield you the floor, and then we'll talk. I'll, I'll, I'll. Since it's supposed to be a conversation, I'll stay right here. Uh, but thank you very much, Spignev. Thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to speak today. I don't know whether it's a privilege or a punishment to be up here all by myself for a, for a period of interrogation. Uh, but it is always a pleasure to be back in Warsaw, especially since it's just over a half a year uh, before our very important uh, NATO summit that will take place in this great city. And our leaders will come together at a time of uh, tremendous uncertainty, uh, tre tremendous change in the world uh, to review the progress we've made in the two years since the Wales Summit, but even more importantly, to chart a course for the future. So before we go into the interrogation phase, let me uh, say a few uh, thoughts about the challenges we face, what we've been doing about them to date, and some of the things we still need to do to maintain our security and to defend our values in uh, the years ahead. But first of all, I'd like to, to pause and uh, remember that in the two and a half decades since the collapse of communism uh, in Eastern Europe, Poland has transformed itself into an open, economically prosperous, democratic nation, and it is a real model, uh, which even the Russians should uh, pay attention to. Uh, the prospect of joining NATO, followed by actual membership, gave your country confidence in its own security. Uh, Poland's now a proud member of the international community and of the Euro European Union, as well as a strong contributor to European and international security. Uh, and thankfully, Poland is no longer living in a gray zone. It's no longer the target of competition among major powers. Rather, it's now an anchor of stability and democracy in the heart of Europe. And this has been possible uh, because the countries of Eastern and Western Europe, with a little active support from the United States, uh, came together after the Cold War, rejecting Cold War animosity and ancient uh, national rivalries. Uh, instead, they opted for a better future based on unity, friendship, and shared values within a peaceful and benign security environment. But today, that environment uh, is under threat. Uh, for the first time in NATO's history, we're under pressure on two flanks rather than one. Uh, to the south, we see chaos and violence, uh, failed and failing states, and the potential breakup of the centuries-old century old Arab state system. 
Millions have been forced to flee for their lives, seeking safety in, uh, for them, distant countries. And many have come here to Europe, uh, prompting the biggest refugee crisis the continent has experienced since the Second World War. And to the east, a newly assertive uh, Russia is throwing its military muscle around in an attempt to get its own way and to reestablish hegemony over its neighbors, uh, undermining the foundations of the post-war and post-Cold War order. And this is our new strategic reality, and I fear it's going to be with us for, for many years to come. But these challenges, fortunately, are not going unanswered. Uh, NATO has stepped up. Uh, allies have stepped up. We're demonstrating, once again, that our strength lies first and foremost in our unity, our unity of purpose, and our unity of action. Last year at Wales, uh, NATO leaders agreed to reverse the cuts in defense budgets that have been the trend since the, uh, the Cold War. Allies committed themselves, in particular, to increasing defense spending to 2% of GDP within a decade. Uh, there's still a long way to go, uh, but many countries have turned uh, the corner, and none more so than Poland, uh, which this year uh, will surpass the 2% mark and perhaps might go even higher. Uh, and this is an act of leadership that gives reassurance not only to all of your European partners, but also to, uh, to the United States, because it shows that uh, Poland is serious about defense and doesn't simply rely on the support of the United States for its, uh, for its security. It sets a very strong example that we hope other allies will follow in the run-up to the summit in Warsaw. So this political unity, uh, political will, uh, these things are just as important as the adaptation of our defense and deterrence posture. But here, too, there's been substantial progress, uh, but, but more work to be done. Uh, as you know, the mainstay of our military adaptation uh, is the Readiness Action Plan, or the RAP. Uh, through the RAP, we've more than doubled the size of the NATO response force to over 40,000 troops, able, uh, with a very high readiness spearhead force, able to uh, deploy within a matter of days. The spearhead force is ready to defend any ally against any threat from any direction. We've opened new headquarters across the Eastern Allies, including one here in Poland, to help coordinate training and exercises to support collective defense planning and, if uh, necessary, to aid the arrival and deployment of reinforcements should that become necessary. So already we can say that NATO is stronger and more agile than it has been for a long time, and this is being demonstrated in the exercise Trident Juncture that comes to an end today uh, down in Spain, Portugal, and Italy. Uh, it's the largest and most complex exercise for over a decade. And while the scenario isn't about uh, Russia, I think the capabilities we're demonstrating should be, should be uh, noticed uh, by Russia. But this is only the first part of NATO's adaptation. Uh, Warsaw Summit is going to be a landmark event. It's not just a... Uh, uh, registering of the progress made, but uh, although we have to be able to say that we've delivered on what we promised at Wales, but there's going to be more work to be done as we look uh, out to the horizon to the long-term needs of the alliance. Uh, we need a strategy that will deter, deter any potential adversary from even thinking of attacking us, and one that equips us to counter uh, the full breadth of potential threats for the long term. The summit will be a chance to take stock of our relationship with Russia, uh, to see uh, especially uh, what more we can do to introduce greater predictability and transparency uh, into the relationship, even if I must say Russia appears more interested in surprising, shocking, and intimidating us uh, and creating as much instability as possible, uh, be it in Ukraine, Georgia, or Moldova, or now in Syria, rather than trying to be a predictable partner. And indeed, Russia seems to want to return to the great game of uh, influence and control over those weaker than itself. And this is not a game that we want to play. Uh, so, so we need to address at the summit, how do we dissuade Russia from engaging in such tactics going forward, tactics that we believe are not only against our interests and those of Russia's neighbors, but ultimately they're against Russia's own long-term interests as well. So that is a key question that we have to address at Warsaw. Now, coming back to the military side, uh, the RAP is a solid foundation, but we need to build on it if we're going to effectively deter a revanchist Russia. We need to counter Russia's so-called anti-access and area denial 
capability, the bastion defense capabilities that it has built up so that we can be truly confident that we would be able to reinforce our allies uh, if, if, if we were threatened. Uh, this bastion defense has long been a concern in the Baltic Sea region with the Russian capabilities in Kaliningrad, but since uh, the illegal annexation of Crimea and Russia's latest moves in Syria, it's now also an issue for the Black Sea region and for the Eastern Mediterranean too. So to address this threat and ensure deterrence uh, for the long term, we need to look at things like the additional prepositioning of equipment, uh, prepositioning of enablers, and potentially the forward, uh, forward stationing of additional combat units uh, on a rotational basis. But Russia's tactics, of course, go beyond the conventional, so we need to increase our resilience uh, against non-conventional hybrid attacks. Uh, we saw this in Crimea and again in eastern Ukraine. Uh, with powerful propaganda campaigns, the infamous Little Green Men, and the implausible denials of even the most obvious Russian military presence. Countering such tactics will require better intelligence sharing, more effective means to counter cyber attacks, and far closer cooperation with other international organizations, but most notably the European Union, and we're working on that. So NATO will always do what it takes to keep allies safe. Uh, but another dimension of uh, Warsaw is the fact that in today's interconnected world, trouble abroad can quickly become trouble at home. So we can't try to become an island of stability while remaining surrounded by a sea of fire. If we want our countries to be secure, then we have to do more to ensure our neighborhood is stable. And this means investing far more than we do now uh, in our partners, in our partnership uh, programs. Uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as the saying goes, and that's why we're investing heavily in collective defense to deter aggression. Uh, but it's also why we must do far more with our partners in uh, our wider neighborhood in the east. We have to help those neighbors who, neighbors who are under pressure from Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, uh, to stand their ground and to maintain their sovereignty. And we must help southern partners to strengthen their defense capabilities, to combat extremism, to try to counter and ultimately destroy the uh, evil influence of ISIL, and uh, generally to, to contain the explosive tendencies that are raging across the, north, uh, the region of North Africa and the Middle East. So doing this properly will require political will and will require resources. As I said, more resources than we're putting into these efforts now. And I think this will be one of the most pressing challenges for our leaders in the run-up to, uh, to the summit here in Warsaw. So we've uh, seen our world go from a relatively benign 25 years ago uh, to a relatively dangerous world, but uh, NATO hasn't stood still. NATO is always adapting and reinventing itself uh, so that we can still keep our country safe and secure and try to project stability into our neighborhood. Uh, that's our continuing mission, and the, the Warsaw Summit will be a very important milestone in giving us the tools to, uh, to hopefully bring back that benign environment uh, that we would like to see. So I'm now ready for uh, your questions and uh, look forward to an exchange of ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Fergebo, for these uh, very interesting uh, remarks. I'm sure they will be in detail analyzed in articles uh, after the Warsaw Security Forum. Uh, my first question, maybe to warm up, uh, something uh, I believe uh, that might be interesting for our public. You were a US ambassador to Russia. Uh, what in your view is the difference between Putin then and Putin now? And do you think the, the way he has developed was inevitable? Well, I think uh, President Putin has, has been the same person since the days he was a KGB officer in uh, East Germany. And uh, as he rose through the uh, complexities of Russian politics in the 90s. And uh, when he became president uh, shortly before I arrived as, as ambassador. Uh, I think we saw a lot of the, uh, the trends that are now even more pronounced already emerging in the years I was ambassador from 2001 to 2005 in, the, in his first and early second term. In terms of the um, mistrust of uh, civil society and the efforts to, con 
to contain and control uh, NGOs, to uh, roll back the uh, independent media that had become very well uh, entrenched uh, in the late 90s. Uh, to he, he, of course, did uh, stabilize the economy. Perhaps a lot of the things he got credit for were already emerging in the late 90s. But uh, clearly, Russians were, were pleased by the stability that he brought. But I think that uh, the, the, these negative trends now have become even more pronounced. And I see the anti-Western themes in his, his uh, speeches, his messaging, and the deliberate effort to blame all Russia's problems on the West as uh, driven by domestic politics. I think he saw, as, when he returned to the presidency, an erosion of public support. And I think he found that uh, not being able to deliver the prosperity that he delivered in his first term, that he had to turn to xenophobia and an anti-Western uh, agenda uh, to, to boost his, his ratings. And uh, so I think a lot of what's happening now in Russia is driven by domestic politics. That was the case when I was ambassador, and I think that's the case now. Thank you very much. Do you think, uh, don't you think that it's uh, a bit naive from the Western perspective to think that just telling the truth is enough to combat Russian propaganda? Well, telling the truth has to be the foundation. Uh, we, we don't want to counter propaganda with more propaganda. Uh, and I think on many of the issues where the Russians have been uh, very aggressive in their propaganda, the facts ultimately uh, are on our side. Uh, I think we've seen this in the case of the uh, shoot-down of the Malaysian uh, airliner. And it's somewhat striking that the Russians are urging uh, that we can avoid any premature speculation uh, about what happened to, to the Russian civilian airliner in the Sinai when shortly after the shootdown of MH17, the Ministry of Defense held a big press conference to explain how it was clearly a Ukrainian fighter plane, which of course now there's clearly no facts to, to keep that particular theory alive. Uh, but clearly uh, Rus Russian propaganda uh, is very sophisticated, and uh, we have to understand how Putin is able to push some of the buttons in our, in our own societies and uh, gain support for what uh, our policies, such as the illegal annexation of Crimea, which uh, should unite us in, in, in opposition to, to what the Russians have done. Uh, I think he has succeeded some, to some degree in putting forward a very inaccurate revisionist history of the last 20, 25 years. Uh, I think it's forgotten by many of peop the people in our own societies how much we reached out to Russia, how much we tried to help Russia, to include Russia in our common European security structures. Uh, we even helped Russia acquire 3,000 nuclear weapons from, from Ukraine as under the Budapest uh, memorandum. Uh, so the idea that uh, our strategy since the end of the Cold War has been to weaken and marginalize Russia is simply borne out by the, not borne out by the facts. But nevertheless, a lot of people in our societies believe this. So we need not just to, to uh, uh, tell the truth, but be more persistent in explaining our side of the story. Would you give an interview to Russia today? <laughs> I've done that once before. Do, uh, do, it was you, several years do ago. you regret? <laughs> no, I thought it was actually an opportunity. Um, it was on the subject of missile defense. I was attending um, Moscow security conference, the first, first one they held, I think it was in 2012. And it was an opportunity to, I think, put, put some facts on the record uh, that exposed the, uh, the fallaciousness of the Russian uh, propaganda campaign against missile defense. So I'm not sure that I would get a similar opportunity in, in today's uh, environment, however. You're responsible for NATO intelligence. Um, how do you deal with the reality that NATO is only as secure as its weakest member? Well, this is that's not only a question about intelligence. Obviously, uh, every ally on the defense side has to uh, do its fair share. And we have a NATO collective defense planning process that uh, ensures that even sm sm the smallest ally can make a tangible contribution to our overall defense and, of course, to its own uh, territorial defense, which is a you know, defense starts at home. On the intelligence side, uh, 
I think we have pretty good procedures in place for, uh, for uh, providing security clearances to people uh, working within the alliance, uh, both on the civilian and the military side, and in protecting uh, the intelligence information that allies share with us. Yes, there have been a few uh, uh, breaches over the years, but this happens in our countries as well. But I think on the whole, allies recognize the importance of upholding NATO security standards. And it's especially tricky when NATO itself doesn't collect any intelligence. We're completely dependent on what the, the nations will share to us. So we go out of our way to assure all the services around the alliance that information they provide to us with, with whatever restrictions they put on it will be protected, will only be shared to the degree that they uh, are prepared to see it shared, whether with members or with partners. So uh, I think on that, that score, we're in pretty good shape. Where I'm worried, as I said in my remarks, is we don't have the ability to, to, to share intelligence, to feed it into our system as quickly so, as we need in, uh, in the face of hybrid challenges and uh, the Russians' ability to rapidly mobilize forces. So if on intelligence we are uh, secure, maybe one question about the GDP spending. Uh, uh, should the two percent rule become a condition for membership or should participation rights be suspended for consistent failure to comply? I don't think we uh, could ever get allies to agree on, on, on sanctions within the alliance for uh, for those countries who don't live up to the defense spending pledge. We're a democratic alliance. We have to voluntarily do our part to, uh, to keep NATO strong. I think a little more transparency, however, never hurts. Uh, we, we do that now more regularly at our uh, defense ministers' meetings where we, we don't literally call it naming and shaming, but we do highlight which countries are delivering, whether it comes to their force commitments or generating forces for our operations and those who are underperforming. So and I think if, this kind so, of transparency so if, can, can help. So if not, maybe, maybe NATO should have a common accounting standards on defense spendings. Well, we do try to use a standardized methodology so that we, we're not you know, unfairly comparing one country to the next. And people do put different things in their defense budgets uh, in some countries that, uh, uh, but we take that into account. Uh, but this transparency within the 28 nations, I think, also could be extended to the 28 parliaments. I think uh, they, they need to know more about what their own governments are doing or not doing, as the case may be. So maybe, maybe some questions about NATO's neighborhood. Is uh, migration crisis a NATO issue? No, at, the, at least not at the moment. Uh, the, NATO is not playing any, uh, any role in... Uh, in trying to manage the, the uh, increasing uh, flow okay. of, of migrants. So, so maybe another question yeah. about our neighborhood. Um, would NATO sacrifice Ukraine's interests in order to protect its own? Is it in danger of doing this? We are doing our best uh, in tandem with, in, with uh, individual members of the alliance to try to give support to Ukraine. NATO's efforts focus on the defense and security sector, where we're, we've been working with them for many years on defense reforms. And we're stepping up that effort by deploying to Kiev a, a team of NATO advisors that are working day by day in the Ministry of Defense. We have trust funds to help improve their logistics, command and control. And this complements the direct military training they're getting from uh, the US, UK, and a few other allies. Uh, at the same time, the illegal annexation of Crimea and the continuing uh, Russian-backed insurgency in eastern Ukraine uh, unfortunately highlights the difference between being a member of NATO and being a partner of NATO. Uh, Ukraine is not under Article 5, and uh, allies from the very beginning of the crisis uh, were not prepared to, 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 to go to war over this, and so we've looked to other forms of pressure to impose costs on Russia for its aggression. Uh, the sanctions, while not decided at NATO, of course, are being implemented by all, all the NATO members, and that's our principal form of leverage. So we're doing what we can, but Ukraine certainly deserves as much support as, uh, as our member states can, can provide. 
because I agree with those who said earlier in the, in the conference that uh, helping Ukraine succeed as a well-governed market democracy and demo uh, market economy and democracy is the best uh, answer to President Putin. So maybe let's go south for a second um, before we will go back um, to Poland. Uh, how deep can Turkey go into the Middle East without undermining NATO's collective security? How deep can Turkey go into the Middle East without undermining NATO's collective security? I'm not sure I kind of fully agree with the whole concept of your uh, underpinning your question. I mean, Turkey is a, is a key ally on a, on a very dangerous frontier of the alliance with uh, directly facing all these centrifugal forces of uh, instability and uh, radicalization and the growth of uh, the Islamic State. So Turkey, of course, needs our support, and we've done steps over the last couple of years to provide reassurance to Turkey. There's been uh, the deployment of Patriot batteries to deter Assad's regime from firing ballistic missiles against our ally. And of course, Turkey has been an active player in uh, efforts to assist some of the countries in the Middle East and North Africa to uh, strengthen their capacity to, to fight against these radical forces. So I think it's, it's always a challenge to, uh, to coordinate our policies. A lot of this is taking place through the coalition against ISIL and through bilateral contacts. But uh, at NATO, I think we've seen strong solidarity with Turkey, recognizing its, its vulnerability as well as the domestic terrorist threat that it's trying to, uh, to grapple with at the same time. Okay, so let's go maybe to, um, to Poland uh, and more specifically to the northern eastern part of Poland. There is uh, a term called uh, Suwalki Gap. Poles know where Suwalki are, is the, the North Pole of Poland. The coldest uh, weather is always over there. So, Suwałki Gap, uh, according to General Ben Hodges, is one of the most uh, strategic spots, one of two, in fact, as he mentioned, one of two most strategic spots on the map of Europe. It's uh, 70 kilometers of the Polish border between Kaliningrad and, and Belarus. If Russia will take over control over the Suwałki Gap, it will definitely cut out Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia from the West. Uh, does it mean that uh, if General Hodge undermines that this is the hot spot on the security of Europe, does it mean that Baltic states are somehow in the confrontation case, in contingency plan, to be sacrificed? Well, the, the, the short answer to your question is we're uh, not going to sacrifice any ally. We will defend any ally. But the Suwalki gap is one of the many uh, aspects that we have to take into account in ensuring that we do have effective plans to defend Poland and the Baltic states and to ensure that we can bring the reinforcements that we've committed to bring uh, into any country that's coming under threat. Uh, of course, land access is only one of the ways to bring in those reinforcements. But as I mentioned, we have to reckon with the uh, build up of Russian naval and air power as well. So there's, there's many challenges that we need to uh, address in delivering a credible and effective reinforcement strategy for the defense of uh, any Eastern ally. And that's one of the challenges that we have to, uh, have to meet uh, between now and the Warsaw Summit. Uh, that's why I said that uh, the readiness action plan is, is the foundation. Now we have to build on that foundation uh, to ensure we can really deter aggression in the first place. And the best way to deter is, is showing that you have the capability, even against challenging conditions, to deliver a credible uh, military response to any aggressor. And of course, the hybrid scenarios add to the complexity of that, but uh, we have to be able to be direct aggression as well as hybrid aggression. Um, so maybe one question about um, installations in Poland. I will not ask about bases because you already um, touched this subject uh, and maybe it will be somehow referred in the questions. But one question, uh, a bit joke maybe, uh, is the next um, NATO center on uh, center of excellence on hybrid warfare will be based in Poland or in Baltic states where it will be based? 
or what should what it should yeah, be? Yeah, well, I, as I recall, I attended an, a summer ceremony a few weeks ago uh, on the launching of a center of excellence on counterintelligence, which is very much a dimension of hybrid warfare, which will be, uh, I think, co-sponsored by Poland and Slovakia. Um, so let's say so Poland. So, it's yeah, okay. the, the main it's the main okay. center will be in Poland, and the training facility will be in Slovakia. So. Uh, that's a very good initiative. We take it as a promise. <laughs> um, as um, I would like to yield the floor to the public, and uh, uh, my last question, um, the maybe easier one, uh, will the Warsaw NATO Summit 2060 uh, will be in uh, retrospect as uh, perceived as a radical change in NATO's direction? Well, yeah, historians might, might use the term radical. Uh, I think it will be a very significant summit. Uh, it has to be because the, uh, the security situation has uh, become even more complex since uh, the whale summit. You know, that was our immediate answer to uh, the new threats that we, that we now see from Russia. And then the, the challenges to the south, while they were getting worse, I think weren't as stark as they are today. So. So now we, uh, we have, have to, to step up even further. I think we need uh, especially to make deterrence credible for the long haul. This is no longer uh, seen as a, as a temporary shift in the, in the Euro Europe, European security situation. It's a long-term shift, and we need a long-term response. By the same token, the challenges from the South are much more complex and diverse. and. We also need to be very creative on how NATO is going to play its part within the larger international community to address the uh, continuing expansion of radical forces and the continued erosion of, uh, of many of the, uh, of the countries on our periphery. So we have to have a neighborhood strategy, a 360-degree deterrent strategy. So I think all that will add up to a pretty significant uh, summit uh, agenda, and I'm uh, confident that the decisions will, will warrant high praise, if not being termed radical. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. It was the easy part. Now let's try the more challenging part. Uh, who would like to ask a question? I see one of the new security leaders here. I see Ambassador over there. Okay, so let's time with a young voice. And then Ambassador, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lukam Geladze. I'm from Georgia, from Cybersecurity Bureau. Thank you for this great opportunity. And my question is, take into consideration the above-mentioned facts and threats. Uh, what kind of messages should Georgia expect from a Warsaw NATO summit in 2016? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Maybe let's call it because we don't have that much time. So, Ambassador, we'll collect a few questions. So. Thank you very much, Ambassador, yeah, for yeah, your yeah. presentations and your ideas. I am the Ambassador of Romania to Poland, and uh, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, organizing uh, this, uh, this event. I would have two questions. First, uh, Ambassador, you have attended uh, just a couple of days ago a, a very important meeting in Bucharest, a meeting of uh, heads of state uh, of uh, so-called eastern flank countries. Uh, NATO countries that are at the eastern frontier of uh, both NATO and the European Union. What do you think was the main achievement of that meeting? And uh, secondly, uh, there is a lot of well, discussion about uh, uh, cooperation between NATO and the European Union. What's your opinion about the future of that cooperation, uh, especially in the view of the, the uh, NATO summit uh, next year in Warsaw? Thank you. Both achievements. We are not talking about stepping down the government, but 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 um, yes, there was a question. Is it me? Um, thank you very much for your excellent presentation and questions. I'm Mariana Bujeran from Central European University in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, my question is as follows: uh, we, uh, You have discussed the NATO engagement and the need for greater engagement with the, which called the wider neighborhood, which is these, they've been called the in-between states, Ukraine, um, Moldova, and Georgia. We don't even have sort of a proper category for these states uh, yet. Um, 
And uh, in terms of, in their relations with NATO, usually we discuss them um, sort of in terms of membership or no membership. And since membership is not looking too good at the moment, uh, not in the foreseeable future, my question is as follows. Do you uh, think the existing institutions of engagement of these in-between countries, this wider neighborhood, with the alliance are adequate? Um, or is there any other format short of full membership, which is, which is uh, kind of um, not a short-term and medium-term prospect, that would better address the new security challenges in the region? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Maybe last question, and I will give a chance to uh, Ambassador to respond. Tomasz Łoń, uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Poland. Uh, Ambassador... Uh, Organizer of NATO Summit 2016 in Poland. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ambassador, uh, uh, a little bit about uh, NATO-EU relations. Uh, uh, NATO is preparing for the summit in Warsaw. Uh, EU is working on uh, its new global strategy. Uh, to be ready in June. Uh, the summit, NATO summit, is also an opportunity to meet. Uh, when we speak about resilience and, and deterrence, uh, the civic component uh, is, is an important one. Uh, in your view, can we expect uh, a breakthrough in NATO-EU relations in eight months to come? Uh, and uh, given the traditional challenges to NATO-EU uh, to NATO -EU relations, um, uh, is the, the breakthrough uh, possible, uh, if any? Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador. Okay, let me take all those maybe in a slightly different order. Uh, since we had two on NATO-EU, I'll come to that at the end. Uh, well, first of all, on Georgia, uh, and what, what can be expected from the Warsaw Summit. Uh, George, of course, is one of the four aspiring members. Uh, and at the same time, Georgia has some additional uh, credentials uh, as a country that uh, got the status at our last summit of uh, sort of the top five partners, uh, which has given Georgia access to a broader spectrum of uh, activities, interoperability programs, uh, engagement with the NATO Response Force. And Georgia, of course, by its own efforts, has uh, achieved the status of being the second largest troop contributor of, of any nation, not just members or, or partners, uh, in Afghanistan, with close to 900 troops there as part of the train, advise, and assist mission. So Georgia will, uh, first of all, I think, get a lot of uh, expressions of, of support, gratitude, and uh, recognition of the tremendous progress Georgia has made in coming closer to the alliance and becoming a, uh, a strong contributor to, uh, to the work of the alliance. As to what we will say about Georgia's membership aspirations, that's right now a very de delicate subject that we're discussing uh, even in the coming weeks. On the uh, broader open door question, as you probably know, our foreign ministers agreed uh, last year that this December, less than a month from now, they will uh, assess the uh, st standing of Montenegro and whether or not to issue an invitation for Montenegro to, to actually join the alliance. So we may have more to say about the other aspirants, Georgia, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, and Bosnia at that time. But I think the aim will be to give continued encouragement to Georgia to recognize the progress made. As we said at the Whale Summit, Georgia has the tools it needs to pursue not only closer integration, but its membership aspirations with the Alliance. But I don't think we will give uh, any specific timeline uh, uh, at this upcoming foreign minister's meeting. Uh, let me address the, the question relating to the, to the eastern neighborhood, because it's very much related to Georgia, but also Ukraine and Moldova. I, I think the, the mechanisms we have are, are adequate. We could certainly benefit from additional resources in terms of the defense capacity building uh, programs we have. Uh, we're launching one with Moldova, which has a very rudimentary military capabilities now, and they, you know, we, could, we could certainly do more, assuming they sort out their current internal governmental uh, crisis. 
And uh, we're doing a lot with Ukraine, but that could be ramped up further. And with Georgia, we have a very robust relationship, including uh, opening a joint training and evaluation center in Georgia. So uh, I think there's a lot that can be done within existing uh, mechanisms. And this enhanced uh, program that Georgia, along with Australia, New uh, Finland, Sweden, and Jordan is a member of, gives uh, the potential for additional uh, technical assistance and military-to-military -military cooperation. There will always be a dividing line between partner and member. We're not, we can't blur that distinction because either you have Article 5 or you don't. Uh, but I think there is scope for countries to achieve you know, the highest standards of interoperability so that if they aspire for membership, either now or in the future, it would be a very short, uh, short leap uh, to get that. On uh, the meeting in Bucharest, uh, I was privileged to be able to uh, attend on behalf of the Secretary General, and I think it was a very positive event. Uh, there was some, uh, some anxiety, shall we say, um, among other allies about uh, what might come out of this meeting, but I think it was a very positive contribution to the pre-summit debate, laid down clear priorities when it comes to strengthening defense and deterrence, uh, but without, I think, preempting the very serious work that we need to do in Brussels as we assess different uh, recommendations and analyses coming from our military advisors in the coming weeks and months. Uh, but I think it was a natural sort of thing for the countries who all shared a certain common historical background, all living behind the Iron Curtain once upon a time, uh, to, to express a, a unified view. And it's, I think, helpful when these kinds of exercises take place that bring groups of countries with shared interests together. It, it makes it easier at the end of the day to come up with a, a consensus approach uh, at, at 28. Now, on NATO-EU, uh, couple different dimensions to that. Uh, yes, it's, it's an interesting uh, coincidence of timing that the new EU global security strategy is meant to be completed by June, and we have our summit in July. And we've agreed uh, that we should be transparent with our deliberations so that uh, there is at least some coherence and consistency in these two very important uh, events. Uh, but even more importantly, we've been trying to step up the actual practical cooperation between NATO and the EU on, on areas where we both uh, have a, at least a similar mandate or an overlapping mandate. And hybrid warfare is an area where it's widely recognized that no one institution has all the answers because hybrid uh, threats can be uh, particular challenges to you know, civilian institutions, to, to, to domestic stability, to, to, to critical energy infrastructure, to domestic cyber networks, to social peace, and if there's engineered demonstrations or, uh, or nationalistic unrest. So NATO can help in some respects. The EU may have more of the tools to respond in other areas. And of course, each individual state has to strengthen its own resilience. But, but both NATO and the EU can, can, can assist in setting standards and providing support. So we're trying to come up with some kind of common approach and a, at least an understanding of what would be the division of labor in different sorts of hybrid scenarios. And hopefully that work, which is being done mainly through the staff-to-staff -staff coordination that goes on behind the scenes in Brussels, we hope to have something that we could unveil by the time of uh, the Warsaw Summit as, as a common NATO-EU approach. We have to do it sometimes, as I said, below the radar because we do have still political issues that make, make it difficult for NATO and the EU to, uh, to meet jointly. Uh, of course, hopefully there, there's a breakthrough coming, coming soon on the, uh, on the Cyprus issue, but uh, uh, even without that, we've managed to find practical ways to synchronize our efforts. And beyond hybrid, we may be able to do this on defense capacity building and support for our, for our neighbors more generally, uh, recognizing that uh, at a minimum we should deconflict our efforts, but even better, we should uh, achieve some kind of synergy through a more active 
version of, uh, of coordination on these, these common issues. So I think that uh, covers the first round of questions. Ambassador Fajbo, <laughs> thank you very much for all the answers and braveness to, to deal with them with, uh, with very big openness. Uh, we appreciate it very much. However, I, I, I'm, I believe that you will be uh, ready to return to Warsaw in the future and not afraid to do that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we are, I'm representing civil society, so we are sometimes, um, you know, those who have to task, ask some of those more difficult questions and defend those who are concerned. Ambassador, thank you very much. And uh, we all, I think, cross our fingers that NATO summit in Warsaw 2006 will be successful. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much.